I'm Mike Farrington. Welcome back to my sweltering hot workshop, aka the boardroom. In this video, I'm going to install a chain drive vise on my bench. I'm going to talk about what I make the top out of, the finish that I put on the top, the construction of the bench, and a few jigs that I like to use. So if any or all of that sounds interesting to you, I suggest you stick around. Before we get started, I'd like to send a very special thank you out to Bespoke Post for sponsoring this video. Bespoke Post is a subscription club for men. Each month, they ship you a box filled with awesome man stuff. The contents of which range from drink mixing kits to travel, coffee, grooming, which all happen to be some of my favorite things. Boxes can be customized, and if something isn't quite to your taste, they can be swapped or skipped altogether. And new subscribers get 20% off their first box using code MIKE20 at checkout. Why don't we get started with a pro tip. I suggest building your bench so that the lower stretchers are low enough to where you can lift the bench up with a pallet jack. Here is my starting point, a cast iron vise. This has been a really great addition to my bench. The downside to this style of vise is they tend to rack when you clamp something on the side of them, which makes it challenging to clamp up a wide workpiece like a case side. I also have a sliding tail vise. I don't use this very much, but when I do, it is convenient, and I'm reinstalling it just because I have it. All right, now it's time to disassemble everything. And in disassembly, I think there's a lesson to be learned here. I really think it's a good idea to keep your bench as modular as possible. Build it in such a way that you can take it apart and make adjustments in the future. After disassembly, I headed over to the wide belt sander just to clean the top up a little bit. I know this is cheating, but I'll have you know, when I first made this bench, I actually didn't have the wide belt sander, so I had to do it the old-fashioned way with hand planes. My workbench is made out of a material called LVL, which stands for laminated veneer lumber. And essentially it's plywood in common building lumber sizes. This happens to be a two by 10 that allows me three three inch chunks with a little bit of wiggle room. If you take those chunks and set them next to each other and then glue them up across the top of your bench, you have a beautiful workbench top. There are a couple benefits of LVL. One being it's dry right away, so you don't have to bring the lumber back to your shop and allow it to dry. You can just get right to work. Next, it's gonna be more dimensionally stable. The plies and glue layers help keep the lumber from cracking, warping, twisting, bowing, and so forth. One of the downsides of LVL is that the sides of it are fairly ugly, so I thought I would glue on a thin layer of solid wood to clean up the appearance. But for the first time in my woodworking career, I made a mistake. And I left this clip in because I thought it was hilarious. After seeing the piece is too short, what's my next move? I pull out my tape measure and measure to make sure that it's too short. So I went into all out panic mode and quickly milled up another piece and glued it on and all was well. And the only byproduct of this mishap was the glue line between the workbench top and this edging was a little thick. The shop apprentice likes that I fixed the mistake, but doesn't like that I made the mistake to begin with. With the workbench disassembled and the old vices removed, it's now time to mill and install a new apron and build the jaw for the chain drive vise. I didn't have a particular thickness I was trying to mill this lumber down to. I wanted to keep it as thick as possible, so I did the least amount of milling that I could. And what project would be complete without the mighty biscuit joiner? I'm just using these for alignment. After confirming that the apron fit nicely, I took it back off, and then it was time to measure and mark and then drill two holes for the chain drive vise screws to go through. This mark was supposed to be 1 and 1 64th of an inch from the bottom of the workbench top, and I couldn't find my scanning electron microscope to locate the 64ths on my ruler, so I just marked an inch and then went on the far side of the pencil line. And the exact measurement of these holes has some slop in it, they're just oversized clearance holes anyway. Here's another pro tip. I like to keep an automatic punch with me. In fact, this is one of the few tools that I leave in my tool belt constantly. And the dimple that this tool leaves behind ensures that you can line up your drill bit and drill your hole exactly where you want. 
Notice the flex on the table of my drill press. This will come back to haunt me later. With the clearance holes in the apron drilled, I turn my attention to making the jaw for the vise. And the process is really simple. Effectively, it's an inner and an outer piece, and hollowing needs to be done to each side to create clearance for the chain drive mechanism. Once the hollowing is complete, the two halves are glued together, and that leaves the appropriate cavity. And while this process is easy, I'm using hard maple, and as it turns out, hard maple's pretty hard. So this process was slow going. On this larger cavity, I established the perimeter first, then I thought I would come back and route a bunch of channels, and then come back and knock those channels out with a chisel. And after doing a few of those, I realized that was going to take all day. So I decided to kind of go parallel to the channel and then come back and cut out the waste with a pull saw. And here's the reason this hollowing is necessary. And while the hollowing process was a pain, the result is a nice clean appearance. And I really like that. All right, quick question for you. Is it good practice to spread glue with your finger or should another dedicated tool be used? Once the vice shell was clamped up and drying, I shifted gears and I drilled the pilot holes for the lag bolts that will hold the apron onto the bench. And this is kind of like a double pilot hole. I drill with a Forstner bit the appropriate sized hole for the washer to fit into. Then I come back and I drill the appropriate sized pilot hole for the lag bolt itself. And I think this is a really neat way to attach an apron to a workbench. It's an extremely strong connection that's really easy to take apart. Next, it's time to install the two drive mechanisms. And this required drilling and tapping accurately placed holes, so I used a center punch to help mark the location of the holes. And I think drilling and tapping soft wood is not the greatest idea. This process would work better for a maple top workbench. But I made the best of it by reinforcing the threads with some super glue. And I dribbled in some extra thin super glue, and then I blasted it into the threads with compressed air. I followed that up with some accelerator and more compressed air. And I ran the tap one last time just to make sure there were no glue dribblings in the threads. I went ahead and installed the two drive mechanisms just to see how strong of a connection was created. If these loosen up or the vise falls off in the future, I'll replace these with lag bolts. Next, I used a Forstner bit to mark the location where the corresponding holes needed to be drilled on the vise jaw. As I mentioned earlier, note the flex of the table on my drill press, and I don't know it at the time, but I'm making a reasonably big mistake right now. The destructions say to drill this series of stepped holes on both sides with Forstner bits, and I wasn't confident I could be accurate enough. I decided instead to use a small rabbit bit with the appropriately sized bearings. And this worked incredibly well. It was easy to set up and adjust, and it gave good results. The only sketchy part was starting the router when it was in the hole. There wasn't a lot of clearance, and I was worried it might catch, but I just held on tightly, and it was fine. The last chore was to carefully cut a clearance slot for the key that holds the drive sprockets in place. And nothing says fine woodworking like a good old fashioned sawzall, but I was going to actually take a sawzall blade and cut this by hand and I just decided to leave it attached to the saw and use the saw's power to make things go faster. After I put down the sawzall, I was excited to assemble the vise and see how it worked, only to find this. Essentially, my drill press is unable to drill 90 degrees to the table, and I drilled a hole, and I flipped the jaw around and drilled another hole, so it compounded that error. So I carefully masked off the holes on the inside, poured some epoxy in there, let it dry, and it was time to try again. This tool is known as a slot mortiser, but this particular model has a doweling feature, so I locked the head in place and used it as a horizontal drill press, I guess you'd call it. 
And if you're wondering why I didn't use this tool to begin with, I thought I could get good enough results using the drill press. This tool spins the bit at 3600 RPMs, which is way too fast for these drill bits. Essentially, when I was done drilling these holes, both bits had been overheated and were dull. Here's a random side task that needed to be completed. This is the flange on the handle side of the vise. I needed to drill and tap two holes to hold it in place, and hard maple taps much better than softwood. Just to make the shot funnier, I'm on the other side of the camera doing exactly what the shop apprentice is doing. All right, now let's take a quick look at the undercarriage of my bench. It is a pretty standard frame with some through mortise and tenons that are wedged, so it's super strong. If you're interested in exactly how I build this, I have another video on my channel called Woodworking Bench Build. How's that for a creative title? Where I go into all of the various details to do the joinery and milling and all of that. So take a look if you're interested. I also threw a cabinet in here where I've got eight drawers and I store all my hand tools in there. I think that's an important feature to have in a bench. It adds weight which is great when you're planing. It helps hold that bench in place. Also, it's nice to have the drawers. Uh, it's quick access to change a plane or a chisel or pull out a whatever marking tool I might need. So consider that if you're building your bench. Fine woodworking, especially with hand tools, is a slow and laborious process, and I do anything possible to help me gain efficiencies. Having my hand planes, chisels, and measuring marking, as well as my sharpening supplies right next to each other has really helped me become more efficient at the workbench. The handle on my last vise was made of some store-bought dowel, and I never really liked the way that it felt, so I took this opportunity to jump on the lathe and at least try to turn a nice handle. Turning on a lathe really is a ton of fun. I wish I had more time to do it. It actually might be the most fun discipline within the broad category of woodworking, at least in my opinion. While I was turning this handle, I came up with a wacky idea that maybe I need to make myself a new shop stool, one with turned legs and maybe even a turned seat pan. So if I get some free time in the next couple months, I'll film that and throw up a build video. I find rattle can lacquer to be indispensable for the little things where I don't feel like setting up a spray gun. And true story, years ago I had a turbine driven HVLP system that broke on me and I had a deadline. I was building a china hutch for some customers. So I went and bought about 25 cans of rattle lacquer and finished the whole project with them. I wanted to have a few dog holes to work in concert with my sliding tail vise, so I laid out and drilled for those. And I'm using a jig known as the Parf Guide. And if you want more information about this, I have another video on my channel titled Modern Cabinet Maker's Bench, where I go into great detail about what this thing is and how it works exactly. And I decided to use this jig because my drill press has proven to be inaccurate. And one of the side benefits of using this jig is the drill bit that's provided with it is 20 millimeters. So that means I can use any of the readily available dogs that are designed for the Festool MFT tables. I can't speak highly enough about adding tooling leather to one or both faces of a vise. It reduces the chance that the vise will mar the workpiece, and it also increases the vise's holding power by a great deal. It's amazing how strong a vise can hold a workpiece when there's some leather on one of the jaws. Time for another pro tip. Surgical scalpels are a great tool to have around the shop. You can pick them up for under 10 bucks, and while more delicate than an X-Acto knife, they are also sharper. Also, the blades come in sterile packaging, so if you have a horrible splinter that you have to dig out of your finger, you can open up a fresh blade and know that you're not going to give yourself a finger infection. 
and they work great for cutting circles in leather. Once the leather was glued down, it was time for final assembly. But before I put this thing together for the last time, let's take a quick look at the internals. There's some needle bearings, bronze bushings, and a chain sprocket. And the bronze bushings are really what the vice jaw rides on, and the needle bearings are there to help reduce friction when spinning the handle. And the final assembly can be a little frustrating. You have to plop the chain and sprockets in, and then you have to take and push the threaded rod through the hole in the chain sprocket and make sure that the key lines up. Then you have to flip the vise around, put that last bronze bushing in, and then follow that up with the needle bearing and a couple of jam nuts. And opposite the jam nuts, there was a flange for the handle that also carried another needle bearing. And let's take a closer look at the parts that mount to the bench. There's two big Acme nuts and then these two carriers that hold the nuts in place. And the Acme nut just drives the vise in and out. It's actually this part here that's accurately machined to the outer diameter of the threaded rod that holds the vise parallel to the bench. And if you're wondering why there's rust on the nut in this shot, it's because I bought this vise kit probably six or seven years ago and it's been sitting in storage. I just haven't had time to install it until now. And I left all the screws a little loose during final installation because there's a little slop that allows for minute adjustments to make sure everything is lined up. Then I tightened everything down. And I reinstalled the tail vise, and I can't speak highly enough about how easy this vise is to install. It's just a simple matter of bolting everything in place, making adjustments, and tightening everything down. And I finished the bench off with my super secret finishing formula that I use on all of my shop projects. It's polyurethane and another unnamed substance mixed in an unspecified ratio. And I really like this finish for shop projects. It's easy to apply, it's easy to rejuvenate, just sand and reapply. It soaks into the wood fibers and hardens them a little bit, and it provides a surface that glue is easy to chip off of and other finishes won't soak into. And once I put the handle on, the vise installation is complete. Like all things made by Lee Nielsen, the machining on this vise kit is really good, and that makes the vise operate very smooth and function really well. About the only thing critical I can say about this vise kit is you really need to be on your woodworking A-game to install it. There's very little room for error. And if you're wondering why I take all this time to install this vise, there's a couple of reasons. And the first is because the two screws are attached via a chain, there's virtually no racking, even when clamping a workpiece on either outside edge of the vise. And the second reason is there's 24 inches of space between the two screws so I can clamp up really wide work pieces like case sides. After installing the vise and cleaning up the top of my workbench, I kind of thought I wanted to make a few new jigs to go with my bench. And the first is a planing T-stop. And the benefit of using this jig is it's real fast. You don't have to clamp the workpiece, you just butt it up against this. And also it's perfect for planing really wide things like tabletops. And if you're going to make yourself one of these, just make sure that the connection between the two parts is nice and strong. And also, I like to angle it over one or two degrees. It makes planing against this stop more comfortable. And the next jig is kind of like a bench hook commonly used with a saw, but in this case, it's a planing stop. And I make the base out of three quarter inch piece of plywood, and I make the stop out of a one eighth inch thick piece of plywood. So this is perfect for really thin work pieces. And I originally got the idea for this jig from the mighty, marvelous, masterful Mike Pekovich over at Fine Woodworking Magazine. And this last one's another planing stop. I don't really know what you'd call it, but effectively it just creates a corner to plane into. And it works great for planing narrow work pieces when you need a little more control than just using the T-stop alone. This is the next jig I would pull out. And to make the best of a bad situation, the piece that I cut too short earlier in the video, I use that piece to make this jig, so all's well that ends well. And last and least, I always suggest keeping a sacrificial piece around so that you don't mar the beautiful top of your workbench. This is great for cutting on or drilling into. 
And anytime I create a new jig for my bench, I always like to make sure that it has a convenient home. So I sized all of these jigs to fit into this recess in my bench. And thanks once again to Bespoke Post for sponsoring this video and sending me this pennant. And hey, when is it not time for bacon and eggs? So there she is, all done, at least for now, and I hope to do many projects on this bench in the future, and I hope I'm lucky enough to be able to share them with you here on YouTube. And why not close it out with a family update? My wife and I have been blessed with the fourth member of our family, who we lovingly refer to as the assistant to the shop apprentice. Until next time, thanks for watching. Cheers.